to a, is it similar to Elvis in any way, shape or form? What about your bloke, Ian Dicker? He's a great dancer, apparently. He can bust some moves there, and I've seen him in some of the more uh, you know, fashionable nightclubs around town, and he's, he's tremendous, but he loves his footy. And one of the quietest blokes in the competition, of course, John Elliott Carlton. He's just... You never hear from him, do you? <laughs> <laughs> they love him down there, don't they? Look, it's, it's been a huge year in football, and, and especially for the coaches. We've seen a lot of new faces on the block, and all the old ones as well as we've come to know and love. You've been a year out of the caper now, mate. Uh, is it hard watching from the sidelines? What's it like for you now? Oh, look, I must admit, when you see them to go through their antics, you think, oh, I wouldn't have done that, would I? I wouldn't have been that much of an idiot. <laughs> you did. But, but I did. <laughs> but, but also, I must say that at the start of the year when I was watching, you got a bit grumpy. I felt as I was still in coaching mode. So a lot of people told me I was a grump early, so I, I probably believe that. Yeah, he's carrying on a bit up here in the coach's box today, don't worry about that. Let's have a look at uh, the coach's antics from uh, what has been a big season for them this year. Well, I'm not going to be talking about anything else but the next week and the next week after that. I don't know whether we've got enough talent. We're not just a side of battlers. Oh, well, plenty of Martians out there tonight. Yeah, I'm a bit sick of you, Bates. We've uh, let a lot of people down tonight. You know, if your sister had wheels, she'd be a dragster, so... Plaudits and punishment. The good with the bad and riding the highs along with the lows in the fishbowl that is AFL coaching. Little is left unscrutinised, and even less can be left to chance. This season, the usual dramas were played out for the 16 men with the toughest jobs in the game. At Collingwood, the Magpies' image overhaul went into overdrive, rising to new levels when they chose to unveil Mick Malthouse. The coach of the Collingwood Football Club for the next three seasons and beyond is Michael Malthouse. The challenge at Victoria Park was there from the start for Malthouse, but no one expected the Magpies to be unbeaten after five weeks. Let's not get too carried away, we've won a couple of games. Then reality bit and the pressure started to tell. They said to me once before, how many people work with the AFL? And I was a bit like asking how many people work in public service. None, or very few, because where's their brains? It would be harsh to suggest that in contrast, Ken Judge was left with the relics of Malthouse's glory days when he took over at the Eagles. Despite a list littered with big names, West Coast struggled. We have got some ageing champions and we've got some young blokes that I'm not sure are taking up the slack in the right manner at the moment. Another attempting to follow in big footsteps was Gary Ayres. He had plenty to work with, but it took time for things to gel. You, you just gotta have a go. You know, you really got to have a crack, and if you're if you're uh, pretending to have a crack, you'll get found out in this environment because it's far too harsh an environment not to get found out if you're not having a red hot go. It often appeared that the crows still had bucket loads of magic, but even their stars weren't immune from the wrath of the coach. Sean was late for one particular morning, and you know obviously we can look at certain penalties that you can apply to someone who's late and. Of course, I got the conditioning coaches to organise a bucket of uh, water with a couple of sponges in it, and Sean ended up washing a couple of the players' cars. Of the rookies, few had to overcome the obstacles Danny Frawley was left to negotiate. But some problems were of his own making. Baiting the kangaroo's bench in hindsight, probably not such a good idea. I think our players have, uh, you know, they've got to get more vocal. Uh, I think that uh, North are very experienced side in that area and I think that at times, uh, you know, I just thought it was something I'd use and as I said, it, it obviously backfired. Thrown into the coaching cauldron of Punt Road, his task was made drastically more difficult with the early season injury to Matthew Richardson. Following that, his charges went down like nine pins. At Glen Ferry, another ex-Hawk returned to the fold. To accept the senior coaching position is uh, basically quite amazing really. For Peter Schwab, the task was simple. Utilise the talented young Hawk list to get the club back to the finals for the first time in four years. After a roller coaster season, it took until round 22 for the mission to be accomplished. Mark Thompson's job at Shell Stadium, meanwhile, was hardly one of the game's most appealing. His no-frills approach and unearthing of some of the league's most exciting youngsters directed attention away from off-field troubles as Geelong enjoyed unexpected success. Sometimes even Thompson was left wondering. The round seven game against Sydney, a case in point, when the Cats snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Sometimes you just get a feel for things. I looked into their eyes and I was talking to them at half time and, and they were sort of nodding and saying, yes, 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 we know what you're talking about. But sometimes when, it's, when they talk back and they look back and they eyeball you, they make a lot of eye contact that you know they're gonna go out and do it. And I wasn't too sure at half time, but gee, that's how good a judge I am. Really, we shouldn't be surprised by Thompson's success, 
because he was a long-time pupil of the master, Kevin Sheedy, whose record-breaking bombers consolidated the controversial veteran at the top of the coaching tree, as he again grabbed his share of the headlines. Our system supporters want to be selected. Okay. Everybody's a selector. Well, okay, I'll ask yeah. well, okay. you. Could he just about start Put it this way. Well, why don't you put down who you want out of the side <laughs> so that Ramonassus could come into the side? Oh, well, plenty of the Martians out there tonight. Don't worry about that. <laughs> There's a heap of them. I just gathered my team together because they didn't know that um, the seagull hit um, Mark Johnson. Well, I just had a look at his eye. And yeah. the seagull, very dangerous weapon, so seagulls. Sheedy's Carlton counterpart, David Parkin, meanwhile, took another step in his coaching evolution, taking on more of a mental role. With the reins being passed to Wayne Britton on match day, it was, without doubt, one of the most radical developments seen in modern day coaching. But it was one the Blues pulled off with devastating efficiency. The wily Dennis Pagan had a mountain of problems to deal with early. The selection wrangle over Sun Ryan, the lack of player discipline both on the field and beyond the boundary contributed. But still, a top four finish placed the Kangaroos within reach of a Premiership defence. A lot of people have been, I suppose you could say, critical of us. And, you know, at, at this stage we're third and we're a couple of games clear in third spot. So if you had said that to me at the start of the year, would you take that if it was given to you now? I certainly would have. However, throughout season 2000, Pagan was never far from the headlines. As some coaches struggle to arrive at their respective match day destinations due to human barriers or those of a more simple nature, Lee Matthews had a simple solution. Oh, well, I said they should put a flying fox. And then you get down there quickly, and it'd be spectacular. And you could get advertising on your cape. <laughs> Matthews and his Brisbane Lions were rated as a flag fancy pre-season, but they took time to get going. It was a pretty good exhibition of footy. Unfortunately, it was the opposition playing it. Another team to ride the form roller coaster. Brisbane found its feet right when it mattered. While the Eagles were stumbling in the West, their crosstown cousins, the Fremantle Dockers, were showing glimpses of what they could do. The problem was, they didn't do it often enough. And the frustration showed for Damien Drum, with the press bearing the brunt of his anger. It's probably my opinion of you blokes sometimes. You know, I'm a bit sick of you blokes, but there's some people in your industry that, uh, that do a lot of damage to uh, guys like me. Quietly and confidently, without clamour or controversy, Neil Danaher guided Melbourne from a 14th placed finish in 1999 back to the upper portion of the ladder. Well done, Captain. One to get the with a crop of younger players blossoming, the Demons' improvement correlated with their coach's confidence. In Sydney, Rodney Ede made do without injured skipper Paul Kelly. But five losses by less than 10 points hurt the Swans' finals aspirations and pushed him to breaking point. After Kelly's surprise return, momentum gathered with each week, but he knew the job was always going to be hard. Some of our blokes uh, just didn't come to play today and uh, very comfortable where they are, very comfortable in their environment, don't get challenged at all, and uh, no, there's some, some of them got huge question marks over whether they can cut at this level. It's acknowledged that he'd invented the tactic of flooding back lines, but in 2000, Terry Wallace took the ploy to a new level and it emerged as the key which unraveled the all-conquering bombers. We got the results that we're looking for tonight. We will just play according to the strengths and weaknesses of each side when the, uh, the given time comes. Much speculation surrounded his tenure with the Bulldogs. He was linked to the Fremantle job, but committed himself to more time at the Witten Oval. With a finals appearance last year under their belt, Port Adelaide supporters had much reason for optimism about this year. But something slipped and the power struggled. For Mark Williams, it just wasn't good enough. As St Kilda battled through another season, it all became too much for Tim Watson. Despite appearing outwardly at ease with his position, that became more precarious with each passing week, his post-match performances were never dull. Uh, are you happy with the effort tonight? No, I'm not happy with the effort. I think, look, we worked our way back into the game. You know, there's 20 weeks to go, mm -hmm. and uh, the sun will come up tomorrow. Uh, maybe behind some cloud, but it'll clear at some stage. <laughs> and uh, we'll go back to the drawing board. You know, if your sister had wheels, she'd be a dragster, so, I mean, there's no deal. There's nothing to worry about there. Even as his short-lived stint drew near its inevitable conclusion, he was still adamant he'd go on. In a word, will you be coaching next year? Uh, yes. Seven days after those remarks, the ex-Essendon champion proved a weak, 
is a long time in football. We welcome you back, uh, Tim, along with your president in Andrew Plimpton, back to the show. Two weeks in a row, it's a... Uh, it's a record. It is a record, probably <laughs> one you'd rather not have. I'd rather not have that than there. Suggesting a successful playing career is no guarantee of riches in the coaching arena without first serving an apprenticeship. Watson walked away. It's difficult enough for me to sit here before he wouldn't even make this announcement without ripping my own heart out and putting it on the table here in front of you. Well, we all acknowledge it can be a very tough job, but a most rewarding one, as you very well know, Malcolm, at times, and another bloke's going to get to experience that tomorrow. But this year's seagulls, flying foxes, I mean, who's coaching Carlton? It's been a monster for them, hasn't it? Yes, and flooding. Isn't that a wonderful oh. word in footy, flooding? Do you like it? Well, it probably appropriately describes what's going on, but um, I, I'm out of the game, not because my body's let me down, but I just can't keep up with the strategy. Now, what about you? I heard a rumour. St Kilda, maybe? What? Yes, you. Are you kidding me? I do think, though, there's only one way we're going to top this year, and that's if Malcolm Blight comes back to coach next year. Pass. <laughs> now, look, if I had to pick a coach of the year, I mean, in my opinion would be uh, Sheedy, would be my pick. It's been a standout year, a history-making year for the Bombers, and, uh, well, that's my opinion. What do you think? Tanner, her 14th to f in the top four. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, Pagan, seven preliminary finals in a row. Yeah. Unbelievable. But I think Sheeds, 21 wins is a great season. It's, all, it's always a hot topic, isn't it? Very, yeah. very debatable indeed. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, the coaches certainly had their nerves tested with a lot of cliffhangers this year, Malcolm, and even the fans on the edge of their seats. We'll be back after the break with the best of them on That Was The Season That Was. It's taken a long time. This will probably be the last play of the night. It's going and going and going. Rock has kicked it. It's a oh! It's a race, White is coming up, Cook just passes into White, White goes down and he's hurt. Let's take a look at this. He might have been going for the boundary line on that occasion, all in, oh! Rode the bar, but it's still in there, he got one for his own measure. Play goes oh. on. Good interception there, it's Blakey in trouble, in all sorts of strike. That is a good He's down point. and looks as though he may stay down. You did some big hits there, Malcolm. Did you have a favourite? I oh, did, actually. Brody Holland on Damien Hardwick. It was a real toughie. Yeah, that was a beauty. Welcome back to That Was The Season That Was. I'm Paul Salmon, and with me is Malcolm Blight. And there were a lot of tight finishes this year, Malcolm, and funnily enough, a lot of them at Colonial Stadium. I wonder if it had anything to do with the roof being closed. What do you think? Well, it's possible. Interesting theory, mate. Let's head back to the early part of the year when the Saints took on the Eagles. Kick to kick, Wakeland. Gee, good crashing work by the Eagles. Morrison, Cummings, Matera. St Kilda was at home against West Coast in round three, but looked anything but. Well, 21 points down at three-quarter time. The Saints seemed gone. But in a season where Colonial Stadium would host some of the best matches of the year, this was the first of many close finishes. Turnbull, quick kick. Big touch coming up. It's a goal. Morrison scores level. It'll be a draw. The first one of the year. Wow. This is unbelievable. It's getting close. Getting close. Early season frontrunners, Sydney and Collingwood, met at the SCG a week later. And neither could shake the other one off, setting up a pressure-filled final few minutes. Swans lead by a point. There's still time though. Mercurian. Oh, this is a play to Rocker. This he's taken a long time. This will probably be the last play of the night. It's going and going and going. Rocker's kicked it. Collingwood are in front. Also in round four, the Kangaroos and Geelong locked horns at Colonial. In Dennis Pagan's first match against former assistant Mark Thompson. The Roos were up by 20 points going into the final turn. But that meant little to the Cats. Scholl takes them on. Mooney. They had a chance to sew it up the Kangaroos and they've let them back in. He's gone the talk. Oh, oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, he's kicked the point. That That's has taken point. off like a rocket. There it is. That same weekend, Fremantle made its colonial debut against Richmond. Despite being miles from home, 
Tony Modra marked his territory, kicking seven majors. Coops, clean possession. Oh, Modra, another one. <laughs> the Dockers got out to a five-goal lead, but it would be a behind from Modra that proved the difference. For the Dockers. He can win the game with this. Missed it. Away to the right. But the point is enough to break the deadlock. Porter. St Kilda seemed poised to break its duck in the round nine match against the Western Bulldogs. He's caressed it, the Saints were up by 31 points and looked set for victory. Chris Grant, well but in a season of heartbreak, this would prove the cruelest of outcomes. He gets it out to Burke. They're fishing for it. Smith tackle. The Bulldogs have won and I can't believe it. And neither can Tim. But if you don't feel for St Kilda right now, after what they've gone through, I don't think you've got to have... Without their captain, Paul Kelly, the Swans would also have to get used to tight finishes. But they look like snagging a comfortable win against the Lions in round 11. That's a wonderful team goal. Opening up a gap of more than five goals, they weren't banking on the Lions kicking 10 of the last 12 majors. He's a very long kick. That is a sensational goal. What a kick from the pocket. Creswood Awards to set a wing and the Lions have done it. Back at Colonial, in round 13, the Tigers were behind the eight ball against the Crows. With Clinton King and also Wayne Campbell added to a long sick list, Richmond found itself 26 points in arrears, but still they nearly pulled off the big steal. Belt of the way, Tawny, still Tawny, he's going to kick a goal. He has, it's back to a goal. And then kicks to the goal square, one on one, Vardy, Vardy, well done Gaston. Oh. Welsh's kick four, Vardy you little beauty. <laughs> Got to try and switch it into the Seven middle. days afterwards, the ground conditions and the teams had changed, with Brisbane travelling to take on the Kangaroos. As Harvey makes him pay. Slipping and sliding on a treacherous surface, the Roos had the better of the conditions, opening up an eight goal break. Then, the Lions slowly reeled them in. Ackermanus squeezing it, rolling it, rolling it, rolling it. Go for a goal. One last roll of the dice. Kicks it to half forward. Ball in the back. Running and bouncing. The little give is a good one. That's Croft. He's gone. The handball to Lawrence. To Lappin. Lappin goes to ground. The handball to Powell. While they escaped in that game, the same can't be said of the Kangaroos' round 15 match against the Bulldogs. As Brad Johnson turned it on, the comeback kings of the West overcame a seven-goal gap to take the points. How long to go, he said. Not long. Grant kicks it onto the wing. McKernan doesn't mark it. I think it's all over. It is. Oh, fantastic win by the Western Bulldogs. At Optus Oval, the Doggies prevailed in another tight tussle, this time against Carlton in round 19. There wasn't anything in it all day. Simon Garlick's six goals, however, gave the Bulldogs a slight edge. Brown floats the hand pass over. Hand pass further afield or a stumble by Bartlett. He's absolutely stopped. Oh, free kick to Bartlett right in front. Egan put the dogs in front. Will this be the last change of the lead? Bulldogs by three points. The best back to the wall team in the AFL, and they've proven it again this afternoon. Bonnet. I'm at to deliver. Saddington. Kick. There's a kick. It'll be marked, will it? No, it won't. A final spot was on the line when the Tigers and the Swans faced off in the penultimate round of the season. Richmond trailed all day, but nearly pulled off the greatest of escapes. on the ball. Good. Matthews. Matthews. So Brett Ratton to put the Blues in front late. The same week, but in South Australia, Carlton's run of poor home and away form continued. At the hands of Port Adelaide, it hadn't seemed possible. Close clashes transpired across the continent in round 21. The Western Derby between the Eagles and the Dockers. Another going down to the wire. No chance. Clavers gunned him. Runs away and kicks it. In a brutal battle for hometown pride, the West Coast had led by 32 points at the main break. Dodd snaps and kicks the goal. 
Wait for the siren and the Dockers will win a remarkable Western Derby. How about that? Right through. Ben Graham caught in two minds and has to feed the ball off. Clark, 45 He's minutes out, a good kick. He hammers it home. As the Swans charge towards the eight continued in round 22, they ventured to Shell Stadium to play Geelong. Neither team was able to open a decisive margin, with Sydney so close to pulling off what had seemed unthinkable earlier in the season. Mentioned Graham going now deep. It's pretty late though. This clearance is on. Kelly's away. Kelly from about 75 metres out. They need a mark. Goods Creswell falls at the back. It goes out of bounds in the pocket. There's the siren. The Cats are in the finals. I reckon you can't help but feel a little bit sorry for the Swannies. All those close finishes this year, this year that just didn't quite work in their favour. No, it always becomes a psych of a club too. You, you continually lose them because you start to worry about it. But yeah. on the other hand, the Kangaroos made the finals again by winning those close ones. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Mm. Now, Paul Kelly's one bloke who's made a big difference to the Swans in the latter part of the year, and he'll be a part of our look at the surprises of 2000 when we return with more of That Was The Season That Was. Well played, Shawble again. Good mark, Barnes. Farmer. He's caught. Should be penalised. Here we go, Paul Kelly. Snuck onto the ground then, boys, just quickly. What a mark! The man of the moment, Paul Kelly. Okay at 100 miles an hour. Great tackle. Oh, what a tackle. That is a sensation by Hardwick. And all you win is a ball. St Kilda will run it out. Now he's getting it run down. He threw the ball as well. What did you think, John? Ice like tackle. And down went Lynch. Gets clear. He's gone. Oh, Simon Gallagher. What about Daryl White? Great chase. That is a magnificent chase by Angelo Legas. Who's going to be run oh, down here? He's gone. He's gone, second time with the score. Now, why wouldn't you pass it? Oh, Jack Berry hit a sensational tackle. Oh, Parker just put him about three feet under. Kick a goal, won't he? No, he won't. He's been brilliantly run down by Andrew Shawble from behind. Some tough tackles out there, Malcolm. You know, it's often an underrated part of our game, but when you're out there it just it can really lift a side oh they can be game turners and i've always felt that it you know really stopped the opposition going 50 meters downfield very important ground in yeah. a game of footy uh, and what about some of the chases we saw oh byron pickett it, isn't he quick i just love watching him play yeah. fantastic chaser lightning chick great tackle great tackle uh and what about liver on lucas it was a pretty critical stage of the game too wasn't it probably as important a game for the season but the one for me the perfect tackle i thought was damian hardwick on tyson edwards it was as good as you could ever see in a game of footy. Yeah. Well, it wasn't any surprise to live a feature amongst the tackles, but it's an understatement to say it was a shock that Paul Kelly, his old sparring partner, took the field at all this year. And the Swans champ starts our look at the season surprises. Perhaps the biggest shock of the season came from Swan skipper Paul Kelly. The word from Sydney had been that he wouldn't be back all year. But in round 15, without fuss or fanfare, Kelly ran out against Fremantle. Paul Kelly snuck onto the ground then, boys, just quickly. As soon as he'd had his first touch, it seemed like he'd never been gone at all. Welcome back, Captain Courageous. The courageous captain showed little regard for his troublesome knee. Oh, what a mark! As he gave Sydney's final hopes a massive boost, whereas the pundits had written them off, the Swans came back to life, with Kelly leading the way. A win in round 22 would have got them into the eight. It would have been a fitting end if Kelly had have kicked this one against the Cats. But this time, there would be no fairy tale finish. Other players needed a change of club to breathe new life into their careers. An often maligned defender at Collingwood, Andrew Shawble carved his niche in the Sydney backline to be one of the Swans best. Run down by Andrew Shawble from behind. John Barnes's departure from Geelong, returning to where it all began at Windy Hill, had spectacular results for the veteran Ruckman. Got it. Good mark. And plays on and kicks a goal. Ex one Troy Cook, meanwhile, went home to Western Australia. Given another shot at football by Fremantle, he made the most of his second chance. Nobody in the goal square. It's out. 
we had to get used to Leon Cameron prowling the back line in yellow and black instead of the Western Bulldogs red, white and blue. His presence helped improve the Tigers' defensive tenacity. Wooten Oval did its share of recycling as well, with export power forward Nathan Eagleton, one of the pickups of the year. Goes for home from 55, he's kicked four. Former Bulldog Brett Montgomery, meanwhile, adapted to the pace of Eagleton's old club. They go through Montgomery to go! Great play! Great play! Another ex-Bulldog to find greener pastures was Stephen Powell. Recruited by Melbourne, he was right at home in the Demons midfield. Well played, Demons! <laughs> The most controversial of the player switches, though, was that of former Cat captain Lee Colbert to Arden Street. It didn't pay off straight away, but the kangaroos are biding their time. Time is something Tiger star Matthew Richardson had on his hands for the majority of the year. A fractured foot suffered against Fremantle in round four, cruelly ending his season. You know, he'll get over this. He's had a lot of hurdles to jump in his career, and this is just another one. Uh, you know, the mark of the player will will say that he'll, he'll still play a lot of great football for the Richmond Footy Club. Richmond had more than its fair share of injuries throughout 2000, but when Duncan Kellaway's knee crumbled at Football Park, it was the start of the end for his side as they faded from the finals race. In the West, meanwhile, David Wirapunda emerged as one of the competition's most exciting rebounding defenders. Oh, brilliant work, Wirapunda! But he too was cut down in his prime, sidelined by stress fractures in his feet. Brisbane lost Steve Lawrence due to an injury off the field after an incident at Simon Black's 21st birthday party. Lawrence suffered torn tendons in his hand, keeping him out of the Lions' back line for a lengthy spell. While at Colonial Stadium, the Kangaroos' momentum hit an obstacle when Mick Martin erected his shoulder against the Bulldogs. Now Mick's hurt his arm again this time. This is the arm that he hurt in the first quarter. Spider Everett was another to go down at Colonial. A knee injury against Essendon in round 12 meant we wouldn't see him again until the very end of the season. It's on! There was a return to the days of old as well, but it didn't come until round 21 and hit grounds on either side of the continent, starting with the Essendon Bulldogs clash on a Friday night. The doggies have got them rattled here. Have we got a second half coming up? A remarkable 17 players would end up fronting the tribunal from that match. But on the Sunday, more violence erupted in both Melbourne and Perth. Well, what happened there? At the MCG, 10 players were charged after the Demons and the Cats tangled with the top four finish at stake. Again, the tempers are flying. Subiaco, meanwhile, was the venue for the most heated match of the season in the Western Derby between Fremantle and West Coast. The fight started in the first quarter and didn't stop all day. And again, it's on. And 27 charges would be laid in the aftermath, with Docker veteran Dale Pickett outed for nine matches. One wonders whether they'll be fielding too many players next week. They might have to play short, these two clubs. What a fiery game that was. And there's no doubt when the stakes are high, the tempers get a bit shorter, don't they? Yeah, look, uh, that local derby's become something special, hasn't it? And, uh, I mean, that was quite some serious stuff. It was yeah. almost like we turned back the clock a few years and said, well, go at it, boys. Yeah, ah, oh, it is, but, I mean, the crowd loves it, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back shortly with more of That Was The Season That Was and a few bits and pieces from left field, which made the season all that more memorable. crowded forward line. It should suit Collingwood. Oh, he's gone to roost. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes. What a boss. Still working. Agamanis, a little foot onto it. Now, from an impossible angle. Hooking it back. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Oh, what a goal. Get it to Agamanis. Hook back 
was good by Lamp and terrific more Unbelievable stuff. It's a goal. Schwartz just handed it to our man, whose pace can really expose him. He takes the lot. Have a look at this for a burst. He's run 100 metres in 9.78. He's running faster than the footy. Could this be an unbelievable goal? Lines them up. What a goal. Welcome back to that was the season that was. Some absolutely incredible goals there, Malcolm. Sensational stuff. It's a great part of the game, isn't it? The six-pointers. Look, um, I must admit that Gary Morkoff one. On the ground, kicking it over his head. Sensational. What, what about there? Oh, little well, bit. yeah, but a skill. Yeah, what about what about Vossi's long bomb? I mean, a really, really long kick at goal. You know all about those yourself. Yeah, love that one. But the one I really love was Michael O'Loughlin's. Taking on 13 opposition players, dancing around the 13. pack. 13. Goal. Fantastic. <laughs> I reckon that should be goal of the year. Really? Yeah, no, I, look, I must agree with you. Lockham was fantastic. I actually love the running goals. I yep. mean, they really get the crowd involved, don't they? Yeah. Chick, uh, Robbie R. Matt was the last one we saw there. But for mine, Boya, from the boundary line, oh, that, knew, that banana snap. I knew it would be a fourth one. But that was artistry off the boot. Some of those running goals remind me of uh, in my under-13 days, mate. Now, also, in any season, you've got the trauma, the drama, all the sensation, mm -hmm. but there's also the light-hearted moments, and there was plenty in season 2000, and we thought, who better to take us through it than Rex Hunt? Over to you, Rexy. Well, thank you very much to the Arapus Trutter, the Australian Salmon. And congratulations to you, Big Fish. You've been an ornament to the game and rewarded with AFL Life membership. Well, folks, uh, yibbity yibbida, let's get on with the show. It's a magnificent season and many of the moments have been very funny. Let's roll the tape and have a look. Well, Richmond players warming up, looking a bit like the Bolshoi Ballet. Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy? Not quite. Edie. Over there, he says, deliver the hot dogs over there to Bay 13. Now, have a look at this. It's obviously a goal, but the goal umpire isn't quite up to the situation. And look at that. Barnsley saying, hey, mate, bit of blood on the back of the thigh. Bradley says, where? Where? Aha, a corpuscle. Uh, yibbity yibbida, off you go. Mate, have I lost something here? Don't worry about me, Dax, bring me a drink. And talking about Dax, hey, what about your coat, you idiot? Nicholson? Yeah, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And here's another way of warming up at demon land. Warm up and pull a hamstring. Operator 42, connect me to the coach's box, will you? Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Oh, better get out to see the umpire here. Oh, got to make sure this is a goal. I know it's a goal, but he doesn't. Here we go with a new official AFL product. It's called the Wedge. Midnight at the Oasis, have a look at that. Ooh. And our friend ran almost to the centre to get the all clear from the man in white in the middle. And back we go for the two fingers for a goal. After all that, phew. Troy Cocker Fremantle has left the building. Operator 42, can you tell me which headset is down onto the bench? I've got my missus again. Uh, courtesy of King, a leather sandwich for Harford. Don't argue. But it's not always your opponent you've got to keep an eye out for. Matthew Knights nearly takes out Nick Daffy. And what about Adrian Fletcher's headbutt on Paul Hazelby, the Rookie of the Year? And they're very close at Sydney. Uh, Greg Stafford and Andrew Shawbel. Uh, see you in Oxford Street, boys. Are you there now? Are you there now? Uh, hello, it's Helen from Hillsville here. And it's a good idea when you bounce the ball, mate, to get out of the road. And who said life wasn't meant to be easy? It wasn't meant to be this hard. He had an enormous... Oh, oh you know. What was going on there? <laughs> Thought he was back in Shepherd. Oh, dear. Footballers wearing a girdle? Clive, I want those shorts. I want those shorts. You can't have them. Hey, that bloke over there wants them too. You can't have them. And you don't have to be at the races to pick the winner of the second. Jimmy, this is your life. And we thought Liver was the best tackler in the business. But the police lady from the East Melbourne Precinct, she got her man. Oh, yes ma'am, no ma'am, three bags full ma'am. What's that sir? Two bits of flake with those chips? I got the order. So there are Paul and Malcolm, some of the lighter moments, and it's back to you. Thanks very much Rex, and all the very best to you mate. Welcome to some, there's some very funny moments on that package. There are, aren't there? I mean, sometimes footy's a very serious game, but it, yeah. but it is great to see some of those, isn't it? What about uh, John Barnes dobbing yeah. in Craig Bradley? 
Yeah, yeah I don't is, know. That, is that footy? Oh, it is nowadays. <laughs> and what about you, big fellas, Greg Stafford? Now, tongue kissing, have you ever done that? Be honest. No. Well, yeah, my wife, she enjoyed it. But, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't cross the line with my teammates. I must admit, I, I like seeing the, the innocent stuff, like Brad Green doing his hammy kicks yeah. and he, he goes A over T. Yeah. Very careful. And then there was um, Hurdy. Oh, what yeah. was he doing there? Yeah. Don't you worry where he put his hands? Sort of? Yeah, you do. I, I can actually remember you in a grand final going A over T, as you call it. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, it was on the practice week. So I had an excuse. I was lining up a goal, big moment, of course, my first grand final, and um, I flipped. I'd rather put it behind me, mate. What about yourself? You've done some silly things. Well, I did one here too. Uh, I got a beautiful, easy ball running into an open goal. I kept on running and kicked it through the points. And <laughs> You're it was that, wasn't that light-hearted at the time, I must admit. Well, the game wasn't in the balance or anything, was it? No, we, we were. No, we could have got back within six, but that didn't matter at the time, did it? <laughs> Much. <laughs> oh dear. Well, stay with us on that was the season that was, because after the break, we're going to say goodbye to some of the big names that have bowed out. It's all going to happen tomorrow, Malcolm, the, the grand final. You can't help but get a buzz coming out here the day before. I mean, I've been lucky enough to play in a few, and, and you've incredibly played in five and coached five. Which is harder? Oh, look, I think playing the game's always harder, but uh, you can get fairly frustrated in that coach's box sometimes. But I think out of it all, just the, the enjoyment of playing and the comradeship you get after the game is just sensational. As a coach, do you feel powerless by the time oh. the, the grand final comes around? You've done well, everything. Yeah, look, I do. I think you do. But just on the day, hopefully you help the lads through the game, that's all. What about where we're at, the opening yeah. bounce? Is that the, the best time of grand final day for you? Look, the first grand final I ever saw, that hush before the umpire came in to bounce, and then that explosion of noise. It's just sensational. One of the great feelings in life. You know, as a player, you just feel like you'd leap tall buildings <laughs> with a single bounce. Yeah, have it. Can you still jump? <laughs> Not likely. Well, who's going to win tomorrow? Who's your tip? Bombers. Easy. Bombers for you? Yeah, bombers. Bombers for mine too, mate. I don't think we can go past them. They've been no. sensational all year. Malcolm, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And Congratulations on a great career. Have a wonderful retirement. Oh, well, thanks, you mate. Appreciate that. That's very nice. We're going to go out tonight by saying goodbye to some of the game's greats. I'm Paul Salmon. That was the season that was. Good night. Australian rules, and the Kangaroos Football Club in particular, lost one of the greats with the passing of Ron Casey. A die-hard ruse man and passionate devotee of the game, the chairman of the club left his mark on more than just the football community, courtesy of his long-standing association with Channel 7 and its memorable World of Sport program. I obviously need makeup very badly. <laughs> Farewell also to Alan Piper, the Brisbane Lions president who lost a long battle with cancer. and ex-Collingwood skipper Ray Gablick, who passed away during the course of the season, but will always remain a football immortal, courtesy of that run in the 1964 Grand Final. Loses. Still going, another bad bounce. He's right in front. What a run from Collingwood skipper Ray Gablick. The football world also mourned the loss of former Collingwood and Footscray player Robert Rose Jr. The son of Magpie legend Bob, Robert's brilliant sporting career was cut short when a tragic motoring accident left him a quadriplegic in 1974. While we remember that quartet, thank you also to the players.